Uh, we're both on the tree board of Hot Failure. I had to change my t-shirt because this was the one that I wore in today, which is a caterpillar t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Isn't that awesome? He sells them. Anyway, uh, we're here to talk about the emerald ash borer, which is a pest, an invasive pest that's now landed in this area. Uh, the first one we discovered in Montpelier. February, two, uh, 2018. Yeah, so a little over a year and a half ago. At National Life. Yeah. If anyone's and, interested. <laughs> and we are now looking for it. It's going to spread. It's definitely the adults have hatched, are in the process of hatching out. So we'll find it in other places around the city. Um, the emerald ash war uh, is an insect that fits on a penny. It's about that long. It's bright green. There's lots of bright green insects, as you were saying, uh, but if it doesn't fit on a penny, it's not an EAB. And this thing landed in the Detroit area uh, in 2002, I believe. Right. And uh, uh, it was came, detected in 2002. Probably was right. there earlier. You're right. Mm -hmm. Probably came in on some wooden pallets or who knows what from Asia, mm -hmm. and where it's a it's a naturally occurring insect there and has a whole host of predators that keep it in balance. Uh, it's not out of control. Here, there's none of those yet. And so it's just decimated literally tens of millions of trees in the last 16 years, from Michigan into 34 states now. And uh, if you ever, if you drive to the Midwest, you'll see it all along the highways. The trees are just dead, dead, dead. Uh, it's unbelievable how fast it's come. The insect itself will travel about a mile or two a year. So how did it get all the way out here from Detroit? Ash is great firewood. People cut these dead trees down, throw them in their camper, drive 200 miles, and all of a sudden you've got emerald ash borer spread 200 miles instead of two miles. And that's how it's spread. 98% of the spread has been through transport of firewood that was infested with the larva. Uh, so it's really a people problem more than it is an insect problem. But we found it here. Why don't you talk a little bit about okay, what we uh, found? Yeah, they found it up at National Life and several of the green ash trees there. Uh, interesting enough because the state forest parks and recreation is, is up there at National Life and uh, the, uh, the trees were uh, infested, there's been about five trees cut down there that were totally infested. We know that the adults have uh, exited some of those trees, so we know that there's more adults flying around. And um, we've been sort of studying this pest on its way to Montpelier since 2013. Uh, we uh, <laughs> wrote a preparedness plan to deal with the pest when it got here. Uh, and it turns out it got here five years after that plan was put into place. And now we have a management plan to deal with it. And that includes uh, trying to slow down the spread of the pest. We won't be able to stop this pest. It's going to kill uh, probably 99% of the ash trees in this area as it has in other places in the country. However, you can slow down that des decimation, if you call it that, uh, so that the bug will take a lot longer to kill those trees. And the way we're planning to do that is to monitor and also to act quickly when we find infested trees. So for instance, the trees at National Life, once they were noticed to be infested, they were cut down. Uh, the first batch was chipped and then put into their wood-fired uh, boilers. <laughs> so, it, it was, <laughs> it, they, so those those guys were burned up. And then the next group that we found just recently this year, uh, they were chipped into a small size, and that basically will kill the larvae because the, the chips will dry out, and the larvae need a good amount of material to eat so that they can mature. If you have them in firewood that's maybe 16, 18 inches long, they can continue to eat and grow in there. And then if you take that firewood and you go camping, let's say in another state, you're transporting, you could be transporting adults to the other state. And that's how that bug spread, uh, is pe people taking firewood. There's a famous case where they detected um, 
the Emerald Ash Borer in Colorado, and they were able to identify its origin being in Missouri. So somebody from Missouri went camping and took firewood with them. And so now it's probably in 35 or 36 states east of the Mississippi. In Colorado. And, <laughs> and, and obviously Colorado. So the life cycle of this thing is pretty crazy too, in that the adult flies around um, starting uh, in, in this area in June and lays eggs in the right in the trunk of the bark of a tree and uh, that egg then uh, hatches and develops uh, in, into various stages of larva over a year or two years. Right. So the, the, larva the larva is living underneath the bark and eating its way through the cambium layer. The cambium layer is that layer that provides the fluid pathway for all of the life-sustaining fluids in a tree. Um, so after a while, this thing ends up girdling, going all the way around the tree to the extent that it kills the tree. And then this time of year, uh, starting in about June, the larva will begin to hatch out, they'll pupate and hatch out of the tree, and the new adults will fly out, find more trees to lay eggs in. So it's a pretty insidious uh, and rapid life cycle uh, that results in areas where there's high infestations, literally when these things hatch out, you can see them like mosquitoes. We don't have that yet here, thankfully, but it, it gets pretty thick in, in areas. In Vermont, about uh, somewhere around 20% of the forest is ash of one kind or another. This is green ash, typically planted in people's yards. The biggest trees in downtown Montpelier are all green ash. Then we have uh, white ash, which is the most common in this part of Vermont in the forest. And again, roughly 20% of Vermont's, central Vermont's forest is green ash. So these things are everything where these are the seeds forming on there. And then we have, uh, <laughs> John and I are the experts, right? We have a question as to whether both these are black ash or not. But black, there are not a lot of black ash around, but black ash is an important tree because it's the one that um, Native Americans in particular use to, 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 to get the, the wood and make into, weave into baskets. It's the only tree that you can do that with, where you pound on the log and peel it off in big strips. So if it goes, then it goes a whole part of the culture. So what we're doing now, you've seen the, the, uh, the size of the bug, and uh, we've got traps around town to try to detect uh, the emerald ash borer adults when they exit the trees. And so you'll see uh, next to the credit union or downtown, next to Three Penny and, and several other places, you'll see these large green triangular traps. There's one out here, actually, someplace over that way. Uh, green traps there. And what they are is they're uh, triangular. They have glue on the outside. And inside there's a pheromone, or two pheromones actually, that attract the male emerald ash borer. So if they're in the area, they're attracted to the trap, they hit the glue, and we check them out and find them. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of other insects like to hit that <laughs> glue. And, and uh, this, this trap over here near, near uh, this area tends to have the most High, the highest concentration of bugs per square inch of any trap I've looked at. It's amazing how, how productive this area is in terms of insects. But. John's going to get good at scraping the glue off yeah. and putting new glue on. It's a real mess. Uh, it's, it's messy work, I'll tell you that. I have to wear gloves because that stuff is messy. So anyway, the idea is that we will, as this, the adults are spreading, we'll identify which areas, if they only fly two miles at most a year, and assuming nobody transports firewood in Montpelier, we'll be able to find where they are and then really look carefully at the trees to see if they become infested. And how are they, how One of the other things we're trying to do though, if we, if we do detect them in any of these traps around town, we'll be broadcasting that information on the front porch forum and other places, Facebook or whatever, to let people know that the bug is in your neighborhood and it's really time to start thinking about what you're going to do with your ash trees. Yeah. According to what we've read in the experts, if the bug is in the area, 
you're, and you have trees that you want to protect, then you would uh, arrange for the injection of the insecticide at this time to start protecting that tree. So there are four basic insecticides that are utilized. There's only one that's recommended in Vermont because the other three are pretty devastating to other species, particularly to us. But the one that we are now using in the downtown Montpelier trees it has to be injected by a professional. They drill a series of holes about as big as my little finger in the base of the tree. They squirt this stuff in there and it spreads as a systemic through the tree. When the emerald ash borer begins to eat the leaves, it kills them. When uh, the larvae eat the cambium layer, it kills them. But it doesn't kill a lot of other insects because they don't, they don't get into the ash tree. Yeah. Is, it, is that a toxic chemical? Well, it is, yeah, it is toxic well, chemical. What, I guess what I'm asking is, is there a natural alternative to using there, None that are not effective. Not at the present time. Okay. Right. We're hoping that as we slow this thing down, that two things will happen. One is other, other insecticides will be discovered and, and used. And secondly, that naturally occurring, primarily wasps, will be imported. They've already been imported into Canada. And look like they're going to be effective, but they have to have time to populate. There's also, there's also a plan to do some crossbreeding of ash trees in this country with some of the trees from Eastern Asia. Right. So that you produce some of that uh, resistance that those trees have in the ash trees. You'll have a different ash tree out of it, but that's also part of the future for ash. How long do the trees have to be treated? Every two years. And how much does it cost? Uh, the cost is, if, uh, if you measure the tree diameter at a point of around uh, 54 inches, four and a half feet from the ground, you take that diameter, it's about 15 to 20 dollars per inch of that diameter. So, what we're doing in downtown Montpelier is we're injecting these, we're planning for a 10 year injection cycle that will give us time to grow more trees downtown. Uh, we're adding nine new trees downtown, and the ones that are not doing so well, we're replanting so that they can we can get a 10 year growth spurt out of them. In 10 years, we can get a tree that will be as high as a seal. You know, if all things go well. In terms of our vulnerability in Montpelier, uh, we've mapped out the trees along the streets that are in the right of way so that that's the city's responsibility to take care of those trees. And there's about 450 of those trees that the tree board and volunteers will check annually to see if there's any signs of emerald ash borer. How do we and, tell? And we, we, we tell uh, the early signs. You look up in the canopy and there's major branches in the upper canopy that are devoid of leaves. That means the bug has already girdled some of those branches in the upper canopy. So it starts from the top down? It starts from the top down. See what happens is they, they, ha they, they bore their way through those little holes that were in the yeah. in, and they fly up to the, the upper leaves there. They like sunny locations too. They go up there, they have a meal for two weeks of leaves. So they're building up their nutritional needs for mating. If you see your tree is infested and it's losing its canopy, but it still has some, that's the time to really make the decision to take it down. Uh, another, another area we looked at was Hubbard Park. And if you've been in Hubbard Park, uh, well, if you look at the state, the state house, the background of the, of the state house is a good portion of ash trees. And so we've alerted the state to the fact that when those trees go, your vista on the state house and the green background that you have now will no longer be there. So they are already working on plans to, to deal with that. But Hubbard Park itself, uh, just along the trails, you can see there's about 600 ash trees just along trails. And right on top of trails, within like 10 feet, there's about 170. So we have some volunteers walking Hubbard Park, taking a look at the trees and seeing if we see any signs. Another thing that we didn't mention was the woodpeckers. And the woodpeckers uh, are very keen on emerald ash borer larvae. They seem to be able to, to detect them and they take advantage of them. So the, one of the trees at Natural Life had some fairly substantial woodpecker damage that we noticed this year, which we hadn't noticed last year. And that tree was totally infested. So woodpeckers are another indicator. If you see a woodpecker coming back to a stand of ash trees on a regular basis and leaving a lot of quarter-sized holes 
that's a good indication that there's something going on there that the woodpecker is, uh, is keying in on. Uh, the, the bigger holes, if you see bigger, deeper holes, larger holes, it generally is not the emerald ash borer. These guys, they don't have to go down very far under that bark to get at those. those Honestly, waters. it's hard, hard to spot that the woodpecker damage until it's pretty advanced. Uh, the other thing that you'll see is that there'll be what we call water sprout shoots uh, growing up typically along the lower branches because this tree says I'm dying and it sends out a bunch of new shoots. So if you see a bunch of tiny little whip kind of shoots coming out, that too is an indication that there may be an infestation. Yeah, those shoots are, are, are formed because the tree has lost its leaves up at the top, so it's trying to make up that photosynthetic capacity by sh sending up those shoots from down below and the trunk itself. Yeah, so the plan, and it's one that I would recommend no matter where you live or how big your property is, is to, to monitor it and slow it down. Because in my opinion, we figured that if we just did nothing, that in 10 years' time, the city would have to spend three quarters of a million dollars to take down trees that are going to fall on people's cars or kids or houses at three quarters of a million dollars. But if we can spread that over 10 years it, and manage the process, it becomes something that we can accommodate. Nobody likes it, but we did talk the city council into setting aside, uh, they said they were going to be 50,000 a year, it ended up being only 20,000 a year, uh, starting two years ago. So, you know, we got some money in the hopper. Um, yeah. So you talked about if you have, you know, or, or with a sand. Yep. That, um, you know, if you try to slow it down, do you, do you just need harvesting mature ash? Right, or, or if it's just in the woods and it's going to die and you don't care, let yes. it die. Okay. But yeah, if it's mature okay. ash, if it's uh, an ash tree that when it does fall is going to hurt somebody right. or potentially hurt somebody, then you know, we need to manage that. But, but if, if you're not, not going to harvest it and it's not a tree you care about, then there's not the it's going to happen anyway. Yeah, the, the key thing is to check out what the target is for that tree in yeah. terms of what it could what it could hit, right. and uh, if, if it can hit something, person, or uh, vehicle, whatever sidewalk, then that should that should come down. Yeah. Is there a um, an effort to uh, to save a seed bank of ash? Seed well, seed what's seed happened uh, where it's already come is that. These things send up shoots yeah. after they die or after they're they're injured. So they'll be seed just like with elm for for a long time. In fact, the uh, one of the signs of infestation is the trees tend to produce more of the seeds. Yeah. Yep. Um, do you have any insect specialists? <coughs> Lots of, about a hundred different insect species will, if, if we lose them all, will be in trouble. They depend on that. Yeah, a hundred. It's amazing. And I don't know what they are, but you could easily, <laughs> you could easily find that out. That's in the literature. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of cat cascading thing is horrifying. You know, out, out along the river here, there's butternuts still, and they're all in trouble. You know, they, they don't live for long, but they're still throwing nuts. And uh, but that's a, a good example. That and the elm are right there staring at us. Here's what's here's what's going to happen. Yeah. So we've learned downtown to diversify our trees now, yeah. and make sure we have different species. And we finally figured it out. <laughs> but one thing I noticed at the state complex yesterday I was in Waterbury and. Seems like they've planted all of them to oak trees, on, yeah. like oh. continuous, <laughs> continuous series of oak trees along their road. Well, and, and along the roadway here, right along Route 12 here, are uh, seven green ant. And uh, so this spring, the tree board uh, volunteered that we can get a lot of support from North Branch Nature Center. They, they donate land back here that we have a small nursery on. So we planted uh, seven new trees between the row of green ash in the road and, you know, we figure we got some time, but that's the mission. So on the cards I handed out, we have a, we have a EAV mailbox. If you do have questions, you can write them into that EAV on the, uh, 
Lots of good information on the state website, uh, invasives.org, uh, Vermont, vtinvasives.org. Uh, there's a whole bunch of information about all kinds of invasives, but uh, definitely about EAB. The Montpelier Tree Board site has references to some of those also, so if you go to our site, you'll find, you'll find information on EAB and, and other places to get information about EAB. I have a question about the um, trees that you see that are sample tree or the observation trees. Yes. No, we did. Nope. Trap, trap, trap trees. Trap trees. Basically, yeah. what it is is it's a it's a tree that they removed the bark and started the process of killing the tree. Right. The bug is genetically evolved to detect trees in trouble. Oh. Over in the old country, those are the trees that it could attack. Yeah. It couldn't attack healthy trees, okay. so it has something in it that can to detect those odors, pheromones, whatever yeah. that tree gives off, and is attracted to them. That becomes a trap tree. Yeah. It's a magnet for the bugs. It's not going to last very long, right. but it's enough to get the bugs in there. You cut the tree down, you chip it, and those bugs are out of the population, and you help slow the spread. That's the plan. Yeah, so another do you option have any is trap tree set up in Montpelier? We were, we were going to set up one at National Life, but they found out that the tree was already infested. <laughs> and it was time to take it down. It was amazing. Yeah, they started clearing it off and, and, and they found the gallery. <laughs> just, just a sec, I get to you. The other, the other option with trap trees is to actually put the insecticide in them, stress them, so when the insects come, they are killed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this uh, card, it mentions um, the difference between emerald ash borers and native ash borers. Is that relevant? Like, do we have native ash borers? That we yes, there are ash borers, yes. Okay. In fact, if you look up in the tops of many ash trees, you'll find dead branches. And it, there's a lot of other ash yellows is a common kind of group of diseases. So there's a number of things that can cause problems in ash. But this one, when it hits. So, so generally, like this, the scope that is, that's going to differentiate when you might have emerald ash or native what we're doing also as part of our monitoring process is if we notice some trees that are distressed and have that branching problem where the leaves are gone, uh, we'll take the bucket truck and they will go up there and cut the branch down and strip it to look for the galleries. So we are looking for, for the bug uh, on an active basis. It's early on here in Montpelier. Soon it will be pretty obvious that the bug is everywhere, but right now it's not. And it takes several years after a bug hits a tree before you notice anything. We're, we're just not in tune to it. So we're, we're going to be monitoring for the next, uh, the plan is for the next 10 years, basically. The exit holes for the adults are about that big. Wow. Just yeah, tiny we, little holes. So even with binoculars, it's hopeless to see them. you got to get up there. And even staring at the darn thing, it's, you know, you got to get your bug eyes on. Good questions. Other ones? You guys encountered it at all yet? No. Mm -hmm. What are the what are some of the natural predators in its native? A lot of them are wasps. wasps. Parasitic it's wasps, enough. which you guys have talked about here all afternoon. And uh, Toronto and other parts of Canada, uh, Ottawa have imported these, and they look like they're going to be effective. Uh, the concern, of course, is that they don't start attacking everything. Well, they're not going to do that. Uh, but is the climate here conducive to them uh, populating in such a way that to they get the can numbers up of the difference? yeah you have to get the numbers up of the predators before they can make a dent because these emerald ash borers will produce 200 eggs per female so you can see how a few females survive and all of a sudden you've got exponential in terms of the numbers of the bugs. Interesting enough, one of the uh, monitoring techniques that was used in the past few years. We're looking at some of the wasps that are here already, yeah. that are, are native, uh, that, that create little nests near uh, ball fields, for instance, in sandy soil. The thing I would urge you to do is to go home and really look and see what you got that, that is meaningful to you. And uh, now is the time, if you uh, have want to invest in the tree, to do it. And I think it's a reasonable investment in terms of expense and in terms of consequences. You know, I was 
horrified to think that I'm the first person in Montpelier's history to recommend using an insecticide. But that's what I did. Because we we want to buy 10 years and there's no other way to do it. Uh, we could have cut these trees down. <coughs> Some of the tree in front of uh, Necky's uh, restaurant was planted in 1976. You know, it's this big around. And, uh, well, I think we all know what values trees give to the yeah. community. Mm -hmm. Besides aesthetics, it's a, uh, John had the, the, the heat, yeah. the heat gun there. You could tell how hot it was out in the street versus how hot it was underneath the tree uh, uh, sitting on a park. 150 degrees in the middle of the street and in the shade of one of these ash trees, 80 degrees. Much different. So, and then there's this, the stormwater runoff aspects and the pollution aspects. And just the beauty of them yeah. uh, would be a shame to lose them right away. So we're hoping that by, by treating them for the next 10 years or so, we'll give other trees a chance to take up the slack and, and, and provide the canopy that we'll have for the future. I did also want to say that there are three other insecticides that are not recommended. Um, two of those can be applied by homeowners. So you can go into, you know, Walmart or something and buy this stuff, but it don't do it. It's deadly. It'll kill it's beans. nasty. Too. Uh, yeah, it's just not something you want to do. So you, yeah. there are certain people in the state, uh, arborists or tree people, who are trained and qualified to install these uh, insecticides. And it's an injection, so it is very limited exposure to people. Yeah. Which is the key thing. Whereas these other these other insecticides are ground spray or so. You soak them in the ground and then who knows where that stuff's gonna run off to. So you definitely wouldn't want to be spreading that stuff. Would the trees tolerate a mild electric shock? Sure. Like a fence. You know, like yeah. a fence around me every five seconds. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. That's it. <laughs> now's, the time, now's the time to set that experiment up and just keep it running for the next 10 years to see if you have side by side action, <laughs> one dies and the other one doesn't. <laughs> You might kill a tree, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's fascinating. I'll, I'll try. try. Yeah. <laughs> we'll create like a super tree. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> like a shock. All of a sudden, it's coming. It's Other questions? Well, thank you for coming. Thanks for coming.